Hello, you're watching Tell It Like It Is, and my name is Kathy Beck. My guest today is a very special one. We have Republican F Congressman Charlie Bass, who represents New Hampshire's 2nd Congressional District. Now, although Charlie does not appear on the Bedford ballot, he does represent a good part of Hillsborough County, and as a congressman representing New Hampshire, he certainly represents all of us in New Hampshire through his congressional duties, so I thought it'd be kind of neat to have him come in. Charlie's a lifelong resident of New Hampshire. In fact, his dad, Perkins Bass, served New Hampshire as one of our congressmen in the 1950s and 60s. And his granddad, Robert Bass, actually was New Hampshire governor back in 1911 and 1912. So, so quite a, a family history there. Charlie attended the Holderness School in Holderness, New Hampshire, and he then went on to graduate from Dartmouth College. Charlie's background includes being a very successful small business owner um, of a, a successful architectural supplies manufacturing firm right here in New Hampshire. But he also has broad experience in government and politics that certainly left him well suited to eventually become a member of U.S. Congress. After college, Charlie worked for Maine Republican Congressman William Cohen, a lot of you may remember him, and then went on to work for four years for New Hampshire Republican Congressman David F. Emery. He then went on to serve in the New Hampshire House of Representatives from 1982 through to 1988 and then went into the New Hampshire Senate where he served 1988 to 1992. In 1994, he was elected to serve New Hampshire's 2nd Congressional District and he served six consecutive terms. He then was re-elected to Congress in 2010 when he regained his status very, very quickly as a bipartisan leader and a centrist Republican. He now serves on the important House Energy and Commerce Committee and is director and former head of the Republican Main Street Partnership. And that's actually a coalition of centrist Republicans. He's also a member of the Republican Majority for Choice, the Republicans for Choice PAC, and Republicans for Environmental Protection. Charlie's also a member of several very, very important congressional caucuses, and I'll, I'll just mention a few of them because it's a very long list. Um, the Congressional Arts Caucus, the Congressional Biomass Caucus, the Bipartisan Medical Technology Caucus, the Congressional Law Enforcement Caucus, the Northeast Agricultural Caucus, and he co-chairs the New England Congressional ca Caucus. So as you can see, a, a very, very broad background um, that, that allows him to accomplish a lot for us in Congress. Charlie's a resident of Peterborough with his wife Lucy, and the couple has a son and a daughter, an avowed family man in his spare time, I don't know when that is, but in his spare time, he can be found very active in outdoor activities, and he tinkers with car engines. Pretty good. Charlie, Kathy, I'm happy you're here because a, it's out of your district, and I know that you're busy, busy, busy these what days. What a wonderful introduction. That well, was thank so nice. You. Clearly, you worked hard on that, and uh, gosh, I learned a few things about myself <laughs> that I'd forgotten about, but <laughs> I tinker on more than automobile engines, but when I was 12, I mowed lawns and bought my first car, which was a 1939 uh -huh. Buick, oh, cost wow. me $100, wow. and I had that car for about 25 years in one, one way or another. So I am interested in little mechanical things and restoring machines and so forth. My last, latest project is a uh, 1964 Skidoo Ooh. that my father bought new in 1964. As m some of your listeners may know, uh, and you mentioned in the introduction, he served in Congress. He uh, died last October, oh. a year ago, gosh, um, at the age of 99. Wow. And you t can't get God too sad him. when anybody you know lives to be age 99. But the skidoo was left in, in the barn, and it was either save it or get rid of it. And I decided, since it was a machine that I had so much fun on when yeah. I was 10, 11, yeah. 12 years old, that it, I ought to be able to get it back working again. And now it's beautiful, and I'm going to bring it, I think, in January, February to the uh, snowmobile, um, uh, the antique snowmobile convention, which is held, that's I think, up neat. in Ashland or somewhere like yeah. that, and show it up there. So oh, yeah. there you go. That's, that's apropos of nothing, but I am glad to be in Bedford, although it's not in my district. I suspect that there are a few viewers here that know a few people in Amherst or Lineborough or Mount Vernon or Litchfield or Milford or Hudson or Nashua or Hudson, I mean, uh, Nashua or Hollis and so forth. So I'm glad to be here. I'm on the ballot 
Yeah. Uh, in yeah. a very short time, it'll all be over. I think there are a few, including me, perhaps that would be happy when it's all over. Oh, yeah, all campaigning these, is grueling work. It's a very, very important election, Kathy. It it's about the future of America. And uh, there are two very different approaches in this election to government. Um, I believe in less government, lower taxes, entrepreneurship, a good, decent national security program for America, uh, the ability of people to get into a business or do what they want to do with a minimum amount of governmental interference. But I also agree that the um, that the main mission of this next Congress has to be getting these big problems solved. I went back to Congress two years ago, having mm -hmm. been, as you said in the introduction, having been out for four years in, in, in the private sector. And one of the biggest changes I noted was the fact that people, members of Congress and senators, seem to define success as a good fight. Mm -hmm. I'm not there to wage war, I'm there to win. And I think that we've got to get beyond this so-called fiscal cliff that we face at the mm -hmm. end of the year. We've got to start working across the aisle to the extent that we can allow ourselves to do so because the American people are crying out for real solutions. They certainly are. And uh, I think the past few years have been kind of startling to even those folks who pay no attention to politics. Well, as I travel around the district, people say to me, you know, I agree with you, but why can't you guys get anything done? Mm. And I thought, I think to myself, you know, you're right. You're right about that. And about, um, what, almost a year ago now, a group of us got together, four Republicans and four Democrats, but it grew to a rather you know, 100, 125 senators and members of Congress that decided to adopt as a working model for resolution for the debt, the deficit, turning the economy around, getting beyond all these tough votes that we face at the end of the year. Take the principles that were outlined in the President's Bipartisan Task Force on Deficit Reduction, also known as Simpson-Bowles or mm -hmm. Bowles-Simpson, rejected it immediately by President Barack Obama, rejected by the leadership of the House and Senate on both sides of the aisle, because it took bold, tough approaches to problems that need to be addressed. So we decided we would work on that as a basis for a budget plan for this country. And, sh and uh, in April of this year, we produced the first bipartisan budget in the history of the Budget Empowerment and Control Act, which has been around now since the early 70s. And I think it is the seminal issue of this election. Can we work together to solve America's problems? I, along with seven other uh, sponsors and about what, 31 or 32 other members of Congress who came to the fore and supported this plan, are going to be where America is two, uh, six months from now. Mm. <clears throat> I know that you're really totally focused on, on getting the economy moving and, and creating new jobs. And although you're so well known for, for being bipartisan and looking for solutions, you must have ideas on how this administration has come up short and what needs to be done. Well, Kathy, the, I, the, the administration has been well-intentioned. I don't fault them for their intentions, but we've got to grade them on their success. You know, unemployment has been over 8% for the last 38, 40, 42 months. It went below 8% in this last jobs report, which is gr great, no mm -hmm. problem. But in August, about 1,300 New Hampshire, more New Hampshire people didn't have a job right. than had a job in July. Right. And in September, you know, another 2,400 uh, lost their jobs that did, had jobs previously. The net unemployment in this state has been going up in the last two or three months. Uh, we passed a set, almost trillion dollar federal stimulus bill that appears, at least on the surface, to have done little or nothing. Mm -hmm. And now the president is talking about raising taxes mm -hmm. on individuals or, and businesses that have more than $200,000 worth of income in a year. And I say, and for business, why, that's not a lot of money. Well, if there are about 40,000 or so limited liability corporations in the state, subchapter S corporations, typical small businesses where the shareholders are the owners mm -hmm. and the profits of the business go flow through every year to the owners. Mm -hmm. So those owners' personal tax liability goes up. Now the company pays them whatever the tax liability is, but they don't mm -hmm. get the income. That stays in the company. Mm -hmm. But their tax rates go up on their own salaries or any other income that they might have. That, that, that proposition, which my opponent, Ann Custer, supports, would in and by itself raise taxes on all these employers by some accounts would uh, 
by, well, actually, uh, um, Ernst & Young, a major national accounting firm, forecast that it would take about $900 million out of the, U, uh, out of the New Hampshire economy. And uh, whether you support it or not, that, those, are, those are the numbers. And that's not the kind. Raising income taxes in a uh, economy like this is a bad idea. Now, having said that, I believe that everything has to be on the table. And if President Obama re wins re-election and his idea of economic recovery is raising taxes on small businesses and employers, I don't agree with it. If he thinks that's the way we turn the economy around, I have a feeling we'll hear very little of this after November 6. But nonetheless, I say put it on the table. Mm -hmm. I don't rule out anything because once you do that, you can't come to a resolution. Mm -hmm. I think that we can persuade the Democrats and the president, whoever it may be, that a tax reform package that lowers some rates and increases others, simplifies the tax code, makes American employers more competitive globally. Canada's income tax has been lowered recently to 15 percent. We're 35 percent, and the president is suggesting that it be raised to 39 percent. How can we compete around the world under those circumstances? So and after what's the, the election, what's the incentive for, well, for anybody well, to start I'll tell you a what company. the incentive is. The incentive is to move your company offshore. Exactly. And that's what I want to avoid. And the, you, you don't do it by building walls around America. You do it by making us globally competitive. Mm -hmm. We can raise some taxes. We can lower some taxes. Simplify. Get the tax rate in the 20 to 30 percent range across the board. And obviously, for lower income Americans, around. 10 to 15 percent, which is what they pay today. And the result would be a lot more economic activity. Some project that with an elimination of what is known as the territorial restriction on taxes. In America, we tax foreign income, uh, business foreign income twice in some instances. We're the only country, only Western nation that does this. If we were to provide an amnesty for that, some say as much as a trillion dollars in, in, in capital that is sitting offshore would be returned to the economy of America. Imagine what that would do, and it really doesn't, it isn't a taxpayer-funded mm -hmm. plan where you have to dance on the head of a needle and spin three times in order to get $50 mm -hmm. grant. Mm -hmm. It's different. It's an incentive that, put, that gives companies the capital they need to grow and to hire new people. That's the different approach. Is it the new normal, which is what we've turned, learned to know over the last four years of a sort of an elevated level of misery for everybody, or is there a different approach, a path to prosperity that we can take? That is the fundamental decision that we're making on November 6th. You know what you just said, an elevated level of misery. That is such an apt description, and I've we never heard anybody quite put it that way. To ha ha it doesn't need to be that way. We don't need to accept 7.8, 8%, 8.2% unemployment for the last 45 months or so. We don't have to accept trillion to trillion and a half dollar deficits. We don't have to, to accept the fact that the nation's debt has gone up five trillion dollars in five years alone. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to accept the fact that in, two, in mid-2009 I could fill my truck up with diesel fuel at $2.57 a gallon and now it's $4.15 a gallon. It can be better. It really can. Mm -hmm. All we need to do as mm -hmm. voters is to get together and vote for something different. And I will bring bipartisanship to the table. I will bring a common sense, pragmatic resolution to these big problems that afflict this nation. But it's not going to be all tax increases. It's not going to be all new government spending. That hasn't worked. My opponent, for better or for worse, she's a great candidate. She's very articulate. But t raising taxes and spending more money is the solution in her eyes to everything. And it's not, obviously. Well, it's been tried and failed. Yeah, exactly. Now, you know, when people hear trillions and, and billions and so on, I mean, for the normal person, it's kind of beyond the realm of imagination. It's, it's like comic book figures or numbers. You know, you, you hear it and, um, and you can't... You know, Kathy, a billion dollars is a stack of $1,000 bills, the height of the Washington Monument. Not incredible. And we spend 3500 of those piles every year. And you know something? When I first used this as an example, I said 2,500 piles. And frankly, the whole U.S. budget... And has jumped that much? Yes. To 35 piles. Since 2006, when I left the Congress. <laughs> and wow. And think, think of this. Um, the whole U.S. budget was the size... When I entered Congress in 1995, the whole U.S. budget was about $1.5 trillion. That was last year's 
deficit. Mm. We can't, this is unsustainable. I don't care whether you're a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, it doesn't matter. You know that trillion dollar deficits are going to bankrupt us and our children and our grandchildren. What a horrible legacy to give them. You know, that was a great description because I was going to ask you, you know, how do you explain the debt problem to people in a way that's easy for them to understand? Because, because it is staggering. The numbers are staggering. The whole concept is staggering. And I like the way that you, you explain that because people can picture those stacks. Well, I think when, when Governor Romney was debating President Obama a couple weeks ago, uh, he made a good point. It's a little bit of a, of a stretch, but he said, Every dollar that we spend that we don't have, we have to borrow from China. Well, we borrow it from China. We borrow it from anybody who's willing to buy treasury bills, which have to be sold in order to produce the cash mm -hmm. to pay for mm -hmm. the bills of the federal government. And somebody's going to pay that back. And it's unfortunately going to likely be my 21-year-old daughter, who's a junior yeah. at Lafayette College and majoring in engineering, yeah. my 17 or 18-year-old son, who's uh, a freshman in college, and all the other young people in this nation that are hoping for something as good as we've been able to experience. There's been an element of responsible leadership in this nation up until recently. And the American people are crying out for courageous leaders that are willing to put everything on the table and make the tough decisions. And I'm there to do that. I'm 60 years old, Kathy. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I'm, I've had enough of the fight. I want, the, mm -hmm. I want to work toward the solutions and I'll take the consequences, politically or otherwise, for being willing to put myself in that position. But that's kind of numbers. Don't you think it's really reasonable to say it won't be just your it's kids, not it'll easy. be your grandchildren, yeah. it may be your grandchildren. But the great decisions that we have to make paying. are difficult. Two-thirds of the entire U.S. budget is not subject to appropriations, not under the direct control of Congress each year when they do appropriations bills. The other, th the two-thirds of the budget that's not under control is called non-discretionary or entitlement spending. And those are programs like Medicare, Social Security, food stamps, interest on the debt, and so forth. And everybody, Republicans and Democrats alike, understand that the don't worry, be happy attitude about this big issue, which is my opponent's attitude, will not sustain this nation for future generations. So it is about difficult choices about Medicare and about Social Security, but we can protect and we can preserve these programs for future generations if we're willing to work across the aisle, get beyond the election year dogma of taxing the rich and ruining Medicare, which is very untruthful, and get to real solutions to these problems. That's where I am in this election. What arena do you think it is that the first holes can start to get plugged in? You mean in terms of what we do, do in, between in now and... In terms of the money, the, yeah. the escalating uh, deficit and so on. Social Security is an earned benefit, and mm -hmm. Medicare is an, in, an earned benefit. It, they belong to the American people. Mm -hmm. Medicare is, is accumulating about $100,000 per working American during his life or her lifetime to pay for re medical benefits mm -hmm. during retirement. Presently, the program is paying out $300,000 per Medicare recipient. That's, those are numbers. That's the Medicare Trust Fund. They can't last another 10 years, or if lucky it will, if it will. Take those numbers and say, how do we make the program work? How do we protect and preserve it? Now, there's a lot of, uh, of criticism levied, levied at the so-called Ryan budget or the Republican budget. Mm -hmm. Well, the Senate had no budget at all for four years. I know. D despite the fact that their budget committee chairman, Ron Wyden, a Democrat from Oregon, got together with Paul Ryan, a Republican from Wisconsin, and basically proposed a resolution to Medicare that could have been bipartisan and could have protected and preserved that program indefinitely without any uh, uh, sacrifice on the part of anybody and certainly nothing on the part of for seniors over the, or individuals rather who are my age over the age of 55. And what was the and resolution? Yet it was, the resolution is the so-called Republican budget. The, oh, okay. the, the, okay. the, uh, the Democratic chairman of the budget committee wanted to come out with a similar plan and was told by the majority leader, Harry Reid from Nevada, that he couldn't. Mm. So this is a bipartisan plan that the Democrats are, are blasting the Republicans for that will protect and preserve Medicare indefinitely. Anybody that wants to stay in Medicare can do so, no matter how old you are. Mm -hmm 
what you're going to be given after 10 years from now, choices, just like the Part D prescription drug plan, mm -hmm. which, by the way, is pr pretty popular among seniors and is operating now at 47% of its projected cost 10 years ago. In other words, now, 10 right. years later. 47%. You know why? Because there's real competition. There's real choice. And if you see a sign out in front of a local pharmacy or in front of Walmart, or, or Walgreens yeah, yeah. that says, come in here, please. We want to be your provider of prescription drugs. We won't charge you any copay. Yeah, there are tons of them. Yeah. yeah. That's competition. Yeah. That's why it's working yeah. so well. Yeah. So. And, and yet, you know, if you listen to various uh, political factions, they have you believe that as far as Republicans are concerned, Granny can just go home and that die. She's not going to get taken care of. That is election year dogma. It's so bad and it's so unfortunate because it makes it harder to actually work these problems out afterwards. We had the courage to step forward with a plan and the Democrats unfortunately spat in their hands and rubbed them together and said, now we've got a great campaign issue and sure enough, here it is. And I've, I've seen signs out on the road that say, ruin Medicare, vote mm -hmm. Republican. It's mm -hmm. sad. It is sad because Who it's would ever want people. to do that? Come exactly. on. It's, it has nothing to do with tax breaks for exactly. wealthy individuals. The money that Republicans would save in the growth of Medicare, not cuts, but in the growth of Medicare, would go solely to protect and preserve this important program for seniors. The, re the Democratic president, Barack Obama, and my opponent, Support a bu supported a budget submission that would cut benefits today for Medicare recipients, or actually payments to hospitals, but indirectly benefits to seniors, that would result in real changes immediately, and it wouldn't, pr pr it wouldn't preserve the life of Medicare for a single additional day, mm -hmm. because the savings go into paying for the new health care law. Mm -hmm. So, Well, you know, between everything, and uh, one of the things that has, has kind of blown my mind over the past couple of years is the whole Obamacare issue, obviously. I, I think it has everybody crazy. And to me, I think one of the things that bothers me the most about that is in this, what, 27, 2800 page opus, there is buried just so many things that I think even today, most people who just, you know, basic, ordinary people still don't understand. Now, I know one of them that you've been very active on and have filed legislation and such, and that was one of those cute little provisions that was stuck in that, that mess um, that would put a tax, a, what, a 2.3, I believe, percent, percent tax, sales tax on every single medical device that's manufactured in the country. Yeah. Now, Help people understand that, because I, I think when people hear that, they're wondering, do we mean like big hospital equipment? What do we mean? Everything. Everything from wheelchairs to prosthetics to uh, anything that, has, that is a medical device, to stents, to filters for dialysis, everything. There's, look, the, the, the health care law, the Obama health care law, in its final version, was passed on Christmas Eve in the U.S. Senate with a snowstorm about to move in. Everybody wanted to get out of town. They all thought that the bill would be radically changed in the House in January. But an election occurred in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. and a fellow by the name of Scott Brown mm -hmm. was elected to the Senate. There were no longer 60 votes in the Senate for the Democrats to ram through their plan without a single Republican vote. And so the result was that the flawed House bill went straight to the President's desk for his signature. Now, there are a lot of what are known as pay-fors in this bill, mm -hmm. and one of them is a tax on medical devices, and there are a lot of employers in southern New Hampshire, in fact, all over New Hampshire, that are producing medical devices. That's right. And they have told me, one after the other, that they're going to lose sales, they're going to have to pay this, what I would characterize as a national value-added tax on medical devices. There's no justification. Nobody can, is willing to admit that they sponsored it, mm -hmm. and yet it's in the bill. And my opponent supports this tax. How does she and justify that? I mean, obviously the cost is going to get borne down by the, by the consumer. It can, I don't, I'm not going to make her arguments for her, obviously, but she thinks that the increased access is going to offset the cost of the economy for these new taxes. I suspect either that or... I, I don't know what the justification is, but if it's not that, it's a tax on Medicare. The, the Medicare tax is going to go up for employers to pay, and that tax is obviously going to Regardless be... Regardless of size? So, I mean, even if you're a five-person business? It's an increase in the Medicare tax, and wow. the Medicare re re revenues 
are not going to go to preserve the life of Medicare. Mm -mm. They're going to go into the general fund to support mm -hmm. more, the, the new health care law. And the list goes on and on. There's a real estate tax, yes, transfer tax in there, or capital gains or something. I can't recall that. What's the, what, what's the nexus between that and, and, uh, and, and Medicare? Another tax, which, or, or another requirement, which was fortunately repealed unanimously, despite the fact, obviously, it passed two years before, was a, prov was a provision that required every single company to, sp for, to file uh, um, Form 1044s for every vendor that gave them more, or sold them more than $600 a year in, uh, in uh, products. So if you, if you bought pizzas, for your employees and you got more than six hundred dollars you, you, you have to file an income statement uh, for them showing that they That's had sold you this bizarre. well it, it, it was repealed uh, but this is the kind of I issue that we're going to have to deal with and the biggest problem with this new health care law is the uncertainty that it creates and look yeah, I, I have voted I have voted for next. its repeal mm -hmm. but at the very least can we come to the table and agree that in the name of economic recovery, mm -hmm. we could defer at least the implementation of all these onerous provisions for a couple of years until the economy turns around, because it is creating so much uncertainty amongst employers. They don't know what the payroll burden is going to be. Mm -hmm. They don't know what it's going to cost, and they're putting off hiring people. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure, so. especially a small business. I mean, right. it, you know, when you come down to it, a, a small business that the owner is actually part of that workforce every single day. Well, and Bill Kathy, the, the law says themselves. that that employers of under 50 don't apply, but the reality is they really do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and will be affected, and will have to comply with the new health care law in one way or another. Well, in reality, every one of us will pay, right. in some fashion or well, another. Correct. And, and I think it's staggering, and I, I think it's it's really. Um, you know, and I grew up Catholic, so the word model sin meant bad stuff. And to <laughs> me, I think it's a model sin that something as sweeping as that could pass. And so few people in America really, truly, to this day, understand what's and a, in that and legislation. And a little, uh, a little t uh, delay, in at least, mm -hmm. in, in its implementation. I, I, I really hope that mm -hmm. uh, we can work on this right after the Congress, because I'm, my number I one well. goal besides debt and deficit reduction, is getting people back to work. Well, you know, believe it or not, as I look at that clock, we are just about out of time. Um, and I want you to be able to, you know, use these last few seconds sure. to get out the message you feel is most important. And I don't care if these are your voters or people who are just well, watching Well, I election. want to thank the people of Bedford for putting up with the other member of Congress. <laughs> I drive through Bedford twice a week when I'm going to Washington to do the people's business. And I have, uh, I have enormous respect for this town. It's a great place. And I'm glad to be here for a few minutes to talk about issues that are important to me. This is an election that will be a choice between two very different approaches to the future of America. Do we tax our way, spend our way, regulate our way out of this recession? How do we get the debt and the deficit under control? But it's not just the Republican way or the Democrats way. It's about our willingness to get together and start talking about how we can work together. I don't want to see taxes go up. I don't think raising taxes on small businesses is a good idea, but bring it to the table. And let's talk about ways that we can resolve these issues. Getting the growth of entitlements under control. Getting past this fiscal cliff at the end of the year. Don't settle for a good fight at the end of the day. Settle for a proposal. I sponsored the first bipartisan budget and reconciliation that this nation has seen since the Budget Act was passed. Because I believe that that's what we need to do. That's in the best interest of our nation, our children and our grandchildren and all of us. I need, for those of you that don't live in Bedford, live in Amherst or the surrounding towns, your vote on November 6th. Charlie, it's been our pleasure having you Thank here. You, and Kathy. I hope you'll come back again. I will. Thank you. Um, well, everybody, um, I think Charlie has given you a tremendous amount to think about um, that all of you need to have in your heads when you go to the polls in just a couple of weeks. Please visit his website. It's www.votebass.com. And there's a whole wealth of information on there, including a lot of news articles about many of the things he's talked about and, and also expand beyond what we were able to cover here today. Um, he's been a great guest. And as I said, I think he's been a source of a lot of enlightenment. He certainly knows how to tell it like it is. 
So listen and heed. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Bye-bye.